Well, hello everyone, I'm Gary Locke, and it's really my pleasure to be hosting and helping facilitate this fifth and final uh, set of our series uh, uh, of seminars with the Sign Institute of Policy and Politics. I wanna really thank American University for giving me this great honor of hosting some, several of these uh, past seminars. Today is our last one, and it actually kind of weaves together and brings to a close many of the themes that we've been discussing uh, over the last several weeks. Our very first seminar focused on the US-China relationship and its impact uh, on American consumers, American businesses, and the American people. Uh, and then our second seminar really focused on the impact of globalization, trade. Uh, how is it affecting our communities and how is it really affecting everyday people and workers? What is it meant in terms of job loss as well as benefits to the American people? Our third seminar focused on the impact of artificial intelligence and robotics and technology on the American workforce. Will Americans still have jobs either today or 10 years from now with the advent of technology? Uh, because McKinsey estimated that by the year 2030, perhaps eight to 12% of current jobs today in America might be displaced, gone because of AI and technology. And what impact will that have on people, communities, rural and urban? What will it uh, do with respect to income inequality uh, and, uh, and the life that we so much take for granted? Our fourth seminar was a little bit of a tangent. It was about uh, whether or not government should operate like a business or should we use business principles perhaps in making government more efficient and more responsive. Today, uh, it's really a pleasure to bring all of those uh, issues back home and back to the central uh, tenant. How are all of these policies affecting the working class, the everyday people of America? Uh, and have Republicans and Democrats from state legislatures and the governor's houses uh, to the White House and to the Congress, have they been failing the working class of America uh, have the policies of both Democrats and Republicans led to this current angst and, and nervousness and anxiety uh, that so many of the American people uh, are feeling and experiencing? And is it perhaps the failure of mainstream Democrats and Republicans uh, that had led to the uh, popularity in the election of Donald Trump? Our, uh, today, I, we're, I wanna just give a shout out to Christina G. Uh, uh, who is our, a senior in political science and she comes from uh, California uh, and has uh, uh, really been helping us uh, with today's program and we'll be fielding all of your questions. So get your questions ready, uh, put them into the chat box and Christina will call them out. Uh, it's really my pleasure to introduce our featured speaker, a person I have so long admired, Nicholas Kristof. Nicholas Kristof is a uh, columnist with the New York Times. He's been doing this since 2001. He grew up a on a farm in Oregon. I think he's gonna talk a little bit about that experience, but he went on uh, to graduate from Harvard and Oxford and was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford. Uh, he studied Arabic in Cairo and he speaks many other languages, including Chinese and Japanese. Uh, he's won two Pulitzer Prizes, uh, one for reporting on China and the other one uh, on Darfur and has won so many humanitarian uh, prizes. Um, He's lived on four continents, traveled to more than 160 countries. Uh, but here's, here's the thing. He was the New York Times first blogger, first video maker, and first Snapchat contributor. And he has 2 million followers on Twitter. It's really an honor to have Nicholas uh, with us today. 
because he's really been talking and writing so much about the experience of working class people. Uh, and many of the people that, you know, almost the same people that were featured in Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance, um, coming from rural and, and uh, small town America. Uh, I remember, uh, I have an article uh, from um, the New York Times written by uh, Nicholas and his wife, uh, uh, Cheryl Wudun. Uh, it's an excerpt from their book, uh, but it was, um, Who Killed the Knapp Family? And I've saved this all these years. And then more recently, he came out with an article about, you know, will, um, uh, will uh, President Biden save Americans like his old pal, Mike? So with that, um, I'd love to turn it over to Nick to talk a little bit about his upbringing um, and what has happened to many of the, his friends that he grew up with uh, from uh, Oregon, uh, a timber town, uh, which really typifies the people all across America. What's happening to the American people, the working class? How are they feeling? Nick? Great. Well, delighted to be with you. Um, and uh, greetings from Oregon. I'm on the family farm right now. Um, if I freeze, that's simply an argument for President Biden's plan for improving bandwidth in rural areas. <laughs> um, and so I grew up on this farm. It, at that point, it's a town called Yamhill, Oregon, uh, population 1,000 on a good day. And when I was growing up, it was really an area that had prospered uh, mightily from um, the timber industry, from manufacturing. The biggest employer was a glove factory. And uh, my uh, Gary mentioned the, this article about the Knapp family. So the kids who got on the bus right after me each morning were the five Knapp kids. Um, and my, uh, the oldest, Farlin, was my year in school. And uh, his, then his brother, Zelan, uh, his uh, brother, Nathan, their sister, Rogina, and their baby brother, Keelan, the five nap kids. And their dad had a, a good union job laying sewer pipe. Uh, the mom drove tractor on a local farm. And they had parlayed those kind of working class jobs into uh, ability to buy their own home uh, and something approximating a middle class existence. When Farland turned 16, uh, his uh, family got him a Ford Mustang, and <laughs> we were all incredibly jealous. <laughs> um, but then I would go off covering international humanitarian crises, and I'd come back to this farm, and I saw a humanitarian crisis unfolding right here. Mm. Um, more than a quarter of the kids on my old school bus, the number six school bus, have died from uh, drugs, alcohol, and suicide, uh, what are called uh, deaths of despair, and that happened to the Knapp family. Uh, Farlin uh, lost his job. He self-medicated. He spiraled downward. And uh, he died of liver failure as a consequence of drug and alcohol failure. Um, he, in turn, has two daughters. Uh, one is already dead from alcoholism, and the other is in prison. Um, then Farland's younger brother, uh, Zelan, died in a house fire when he was passed out drunk. His brother, Nathan, blew himself up cooking meth. Uh, Regina died of hepatitis from IV drug use. And the baby brother, Keelan, uh, was spared because he had spent 13 years in the Oregon State Penitentiary. But actually, as the pandemic was beginning a year ago, he, he'd, he'd been released a little before that. And as the pandemic was beginning, he lost his job and he was uh, found dead in March of 2020 of an overdose. So Mrs. Knapp, who is 81 now, uh, is still alive. And every day she walks up the hill above her place and visits the graves of her five dead kids. Um, and I was trying to understand how this happened. And it's also painful because I'm deeply proud of this town of Yamhill. And we had always talked about the very strong social fabric here and how people look after each other and this kind of thing. And yet uh, there was an awful lot of pain and things that were hard to talk about. I've written a lot about sexual violence all around the world. 
And yet I came back and I found that two of the kids, two of the boys on my old school bus had both been convicted of raping very young girls. Trying to understand you know, how that happens in this community that supposedly deeply values, uh, has these great, you know, rural values. Uh, it was really hard. And, you know, I, I came to see that this was something that was happening, not just in the Amhill, not just on the number six bus, but all around the country. And it was happening in working class communities, uh, white, black, and brown alike. Um, and basically, uh, I have a, a African American friend from uh, inner city Baltimore. And, you know, we compare notes and uh, the times issue was somewhat different. African-American communities were hit earlier and uh, white, so white places like Yam Hill, initially they looked at the despair in African-American communities and were often very unsympathetic and made comments about how it's all about deadbeat dads or it's about, uh, you know, lack of personal responsibility, this kind of thing. And meanwhile, there was a great Harvard sociologist, uh, William Julius Wilson, who said, no, it's about a lack of jobs. And Professor Wilson was exactly right, because when those jobs left Yam Hill and when they left Kentucky and when they left Northern Maine, the same kinds of, of pathologies unfolded. Um, and so, um, you know, Gary mentioned that this is a, um, uh, a problem that uh, I think both left and right have, have inadequately paid attention to, both Democrats and Republicans have neglected. Um, and I think that's right. You know, this is not a problem just to President Trump. This goes back 50 years. It, uh, you know, the United States invented uh, mass high school attendance. Uh, we pioneered pi uh, high schools for ordinary kids. And in the 1960s, we still were number one in the world in high school attendance. At last count, we were number 21. Uh, so many countries have surpassed us. We were about even for health metrics in the 1960s. Now we're almost to the bottom of the OECD in uh, life expectancy, uh, child mortality, and so on. There are 10 counties in Mississippi that have a lower life expectancy right now um, than, uh, uh, than Bangladesh. Think about that. 10 counties in Mississippi, lower life expectancy than Bangladesh. Um, and, you know, look, I think it's obvious in many ways in which, in ways in which Republicans drop the ball, um, uh, resistance to expanding social welfare benefits. Um, I think that in many ways, in many cases, it was, uh, tied to, uh, to a racialization of investments in human capital, racialization of benefit programs, and that after the 1968 Southern strategy, uh, there was a tendency to stigmatize uh, benefit programs as disproportionately helping the other um, in ways that led the U.S. to underinvest in human capital compared to other countries. But I think Democrats uh, also uh, dropped the ball. Uh, as uh, better educated, you know, democratic elites increasingly became influential. Um, and, and this, you know, Frank, I should say reflects, you know, my thinking too, that, you know, we tended to see trade as something that would make the pie get bigger, it would benefit everybody. And so we embraced uh, trade and it did make the overall pie get bigger, but we weren't focused enough on distribution. Uh, and we, um, uh, we tended to be, uh, Kind of roll our eyes at trade unions and see the corruption and uh, uh, the feather betting that went on with unions and all that was true but they did have a real benefit to raising blue collar wages and um, you know we focused uh, today if you if you think back to the democratic presidential primary um, there was a lot of discussion about improving uh, college education and you know one of the Big issues is uh, is, you know, is education debt, but I don't think there's been the same discussion that really needs to happen about high school uh, diplomas. One in seven American kids still doesn't graduate from high school. Uh, those kids are cooked. If you don't graduate from high school, you don't have some kind of a, a vocational skill. Um, uh, you're you're just you know you're destined, and your kids are probably destined to uh, to lag behind. We have an education system that likewise transmits disadvantage rather than opportunity, uh, largely because of local funding of education. 
Um, and I guess I'd also just finally just say that, um, you know, how one addresses these kinds of inequities is not a great mystery because Europe, Canada, <laughs> Australia have wrestled with these same problems. And um, we know the things that help, They're, they don't work perfectly, they, but they do help to some degree. And the US has not tended to use these policy tools, especially investments in early childhood. And look, it's not because we don't know what tools to use, and it's not because we don't have the resources. I think it's fundamentally a question of political will. Um, and I uh, think that that has been exacerbated because of a, a narrative that it's all about personal responsibility and bad choices. Um, and look, there's no doubt that bad choices are real. Um, the NAPs would have told you that they made plenty of bad choices, that they showed a lot of personal irresponsibility. But it's so much more complicated than that. And so many kids are on a trajectory toward making bad choices from very early on. We fail them before they fail us. And when those infants in Mississippi have a shorter life expectancy than a kid in Bangladesh. It's not because that infant, that newborn in Mississippi is making bad choices or being irresponsible. It's because we as a society are making bad choices about healthcare access, uh, about home visiting programs, about other tools that can help. Uh, it's we who are being irresponsible. Um, and so I think we need to you know, address that narrative. That was why we wrote our last book, uh, Tightrope. Um, and if this has been a little depressing, I should say that, that you know, I think that there is some real hope now that um, some of these problems will be addressed. Uh, and that may have been true even, uh, even before. I, you know, history, I think, often works in cycles. And I think for 50 years, we had a cycle in which we tended to uh, cut taxes and cut investments in, in human capital. Um, you already saw, even before uh, President Biden, you saw Texas leading the way in reducing mass incarceration, um, not so much for human rights reasons, but because mass incarceration is expensive. You saw uh, Idaho and, um, um, uh, and um, um, you know, other conservative states that were expanding Medicaid. Um, you... Um, you saw some, some red states uh, like Oklahoma do a good job in expanding early childhood uh, programs. And, uh, and when you had Kansas Republicans lead a rebellion against lower taxes and demand tax us more, <laughs> um, I wonder if that may not be remembered as a, as a, as a sh historical shift, uh, an end of that, of that 50 year cycle. And now of course you have President Biden who is investing in programs to slash child poverty, to invest in rural broadband, to invest in daycare, uh, to invest in infrastructure in a big way, who emphasize the dignity of labor. Um, I think it's possible that we do have a new uh, cycle uh, that is, that is gonna begin. And um, it came too late for many of the kids on my old school bus. It, in many ways came too late for their kids. It's not too late for their grandkids. And with that, happy to make it a conversation. Well, so uh, uh, let's get into this. I mean, you talk a lot about um, the working class uh, and you say that, um, but everybody has been focusing on the, a lot of the politicians focus on the middle class. Yeah. But from your articles and even from some of the other authors, whether it's uh, um, Oren Cass, who talks about the value of work or J.D. Vance about growing up in, in Appalachia in Ohio uh, or rural Ohio. Um, they're not talking about the middle class. They're talking, you have a different definition of, of the working class. T tell us what you mean by that. Sure. Um, so there's a there's an enormous challenge in defining you know the, these terms. They're very nebulous, but um, probably the best definitions have to do not with your income level, but rather with your educational attainment, because education is a much better predictor of uh, of outcomes than uh, than is anything else. And so the you know the definition that I tend to rely on is that uh, working class means that you have um, a high school education or less. And 
you know, this leads to anomalous results like uh, Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg being working class <laughs> because they didn't get a college degree. Yeah. Um, and obviously that's a little bit absurd, but in general, um, that, uh, issue of education level tends to correlate not only with incomes, but with marital status, with your probability of having uh, kids uh, out of wedlock, with, uh, with your likelihood of contact with the criminal justice system, uh, with your kids' likelihood of going to college, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and one of the, 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 you know, the statistics that I think kind of blew me away was that the um, average weekly work earnings for non-supervisory employees, which is kind of a typical uh, blue collar wage metric, uh, the average wage after adjusting for inflation was higher in December 1971 than in December 2020. Um, so, you know, you, that's two generations in which those kind of blue collar workers uh, actually went downhill in earnings. And uh, that led to just a cascade of failures, uh, especially for uh, men who I think often place their self-esteem to some degree and their ability to provide for the family, to be a pillar of support uh, and led to a cascade and a political cascade as well. Uh, that you know, was one of the factors that resulted in, in President Trump's election uh, among others, of course. So, I mean, you, you talk about the loss of jobs in, in, in rural uh, Oregon and, and Maine and, and other places due to globalization and trade. But isn't it true that there would have been a reduction in a lot of these jobs just because of technology and automation? I mean, I, 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 I've, I've talked to friends in the forest, uh, forest industry, the timber industry, and they say that the number of people it takes to, to harvest an acre of trees is like a fraction of what it was 20, 30 years ago. And I actually saw this almost like this bulldozer that actually grabs the tree, holds it vertically, and then saws it off, holds the tree, and then moves it over and puts it on a pile and can almost even strip the bark off of it. Or, and it's all operated by just one person doing all of this uh, with this almost like bulldozer type machine. And yet in the old days, it took maybe five or eight people to do that very similar task. Um, so, and then in, in Detroit, uh, Alan Mulally, who used to head up the Ford Motor Company says uh, it takes only 60% uh, of the workforce today to build the same number, 100, let's say 100 cars, 60% of the workforce today compared to 20 years ago. And that's not because of outsourcing or, or whatever, it's because of robotics and everything else. So was the decline of jobs in rural America and many of these towns across America inevitable? So uh, I don't think that the, uh, well, there's no question that automation and globalization uh, were leading to um, real transformations of economies. And we've seen that in Canada, we saw that in Germany, but they didn't have the kind of consequences that they have in the US. So, uh, you know, Germany has wrestled with automation and globalization, but it didn't have 70,000 Americans die of overdoses last year. And um, I think that's partly because of uh, job retraining policies. Germany, for example, is a pioneer in emphasizing retraining. The US spends a much smaller share of GDP on retraining. But I also think it's in part about human capital spending. Again, I use that phrase a lot, but um, one of the things that in reporting on Tightrope that really struck me was um, I went to Denmark and I looked at McDonald's there and the average McDonald's burger flipper gets $22 an hour. Just trying to understand how it is that McDonald's can make money while paying people burger flippers, $22 an hour, plus provide them you know, a year long maternity leave, plus a defined benefits pension plan, plus all kinds of other benefits. And the answer is not a minimum wage. Denmark does not have a minimum wage. Now it is in part a stronger union uh, and sectoral uh, bargaining, but even more than that, it's about investments in people. So if you were people who work at McDonald's worldwide tend in terms of uh, skills, 
unless they're students to be somewhere around the 30th percentile in the labor market. Um, but a 30th percentile worker in Denmark is a high school graduate who is literate, who is numerate, does not have any dependency, uh, and generates $22 of marginal yield for the company. In contrast, a 30th percentile uh, labor force member in the United States is a high school dropout, is not very literate, is not very numerate, may well have a dependency, uh, may well be one of 7 million Americans who his driver's license has been suspended because they're behind in child support and so they can't commute to work regularly and may well be in a just a more chaotic kind of dysfunctional uh, life than those abroad. And that's not something that we can just tweak in a moment by changing the minimum wage. It's a function of investing in kids from early on and having a school system that is less inequitable, uh, making sure every kid gets through high school, um, making sure at least community college is free to all. Um, and uh, that I think is the biggest area where the US uh, fell behind, that we did not give workers the skill set to adapt to a changing world. So uh, actually, uh, you talked about uh, retraining, and you mentioned in one of your articles the example of, uh, I think, uh, a town on the U.S. side of the Canadian U.S. Canadian border, and a town right across the, the the boundary in Canada. Can you can you uh, 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 recapture that uh, that sentiment? Yeah. So uh, the Ford Motor Company um, in the two thousand eight two thousand nine financial crisis. So it laid off auto workers in Detroit and also just across the border in Canada in in Windsor, Ontario. And the U.S. policy response to uh, layoffs was to extend unemployment benefits, uh, how long you could get them. It was essentially to provide an income stream to replace that, that job income. And the Ontario policy response in Canada was not to focus so much on the income stream, to, but to focus on, on job retraining. And so uh, as soon as those workers were laid off, the Ontario government set up booths at the factory and they said to people, OK, um, you know, you've been a, a welder for the last 20 years, but we look ahead and in Ontario, we don't anticipate need for a lot of welders. We will need a lot of healthcare workers and we're going to need you know, ultrasound operators and assistant nurses and this and that. Um, we can start a class on Monday for you and a bunch of other welders to learn how to be ultrasound operators and you know then every Wednesday you'll work in the local hospital an intern whatever it may be and the upshot was that the uh, laid off workers on the Canadian side were much more likely to retrain and much more likely down the road to get new jobs and their families were much less likely to, to, to shatter their kids less likely to self-medicate and you know to me one of the lessons of that is that this talk about you know, the dignity of work, that it's not just an expression. There really is something important to it. And when I studied economics, you know, we tended to think of, of a job in terms of that income that came with it. And it is so much more than that. Yeah, I think uh, certainly J.D. Vance talks about it, and even Oren Cass in his book uh, and articles talk about the value of work and how it really holds a society and a community together. And, and there is pride uh, and, and, and in work um, and, um, and that there's a role for government support systems, but also people want to feel that they're able uh, to, uh, to make it on their own and they want that, uh, that appropriate level of government assistance. Actually, we have some poll questions and it really ties into some of the things that you're talking about. So uh, can we maybe have that first poll question on um, universal income? There we go. The first one, should the United States provide a universal basic income of $1,000 a month for every adult over age 18? Yes or no? I think this was one of the proposals by Andrew Yang when he was running for um, uh, president. And I even think he's talking about a similar uh, uh, proposal for the residents of New York as he runs for, for mayor. So yes or no? Quickly uh, uh, put, uh, uh, put your thoughts in and, and hit and submit. Uh, so what, what do you guys think? Should the U.S. provide a basic universal income of $1,000? Oh, wow. 
50. Oh, wow. 50. That's uh, interesting. Interesting. So, uh, all right. What are your thoughts about that, uh, Mr. Kristoff? Uh, um, so actually, I thought that it, it was going to be you know, many more people in favor. Um, I'm actually a skeptic uh, of uh, universal basic income of UBI for uh, two reasons. One, this question of you know, the value of work. I don't think that an income stream replaces the, uh, the, benef the psychic benefits of, uh, of working. And um, secondly, the cost would be something like uh, $3 trillion a year. I fear that that would come at the expense. I mean, there's so much we could do with that, you know, that issues that really seem incredibly high priority to me, you know, access to dental care, equalizing schools, improving options for young kids, contraception for people who need it. I mean, there are just so many things that can be done. And um, so I, uh, I am, um, uh, a skeptic of UBI as it's framed there, you know, what I think we do need is the equivalent of UBI for kids, for children. And, um, uh, and the, that is, is what President Biden has proposed at a, a smaller amount. And uh, there is, you know, that's what most of our peer countries do. They're called child allowances. And uh, they uh, have a very good record of reducing child poverty. In Britain, they were a uh, key element of a plan that reduced uh, child poverty by half under Tony Blair. In Canada, they've uh, reduced child poverty by 20 to 30%, depending on who you talk to. So I'd, I'd like to see the, that, you know, the child allowance is UBI uh, for, for kids. Well, actually, I think, uh, as you mentioned, uh, President Biden has uh, a, a feature of that in his, uh, in the recent uh, Rescue Act, CARES CARES 3 Act a proposal, and even Mitt Romney, Republican That's right. uh, from Utah, has a similar proposal. Uh, so how, how, how do those, uh, how do you feel about those? Uh, why don't you explain a little bit about how those proposals work? So those are, um, those are exactly, I think, you know, what we need. They were both modeled on this idea of child allowances as they're implemented in Canada and Britain, Australia, and, and in Europe. And the idea is that every family with a kid or you know, in some cases, they, 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 they fade out at very, very high incomes, but, but most families would get um, such a, uh, a payment every month, uh, not once a year, because then, you know, that, then it's not, sometimes money is misused, it seems, when it comes in once a year. Once a month, it seems to, to actually improve the well-being of a child uh, more. Uh, the payments would be more modest, either $250 a month or $300 a month per, per kid, depending on the age. And again, there's just robust evidence that this is something that would, you know, really, really help kids. But, and this was actually a cash payment. This was not a tax credit, but right. actually a cash payment, because obviously if it's a tax credit and if you're not working, there's nothing to credit against. So uh, that's right. There, right. um, in other countries, they tend to be called child allowances. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, for whatever reason, the uh, Biden administration decided to call them a refundable tax credit. Uh, but it's it's the same um, it's the same idea. And um, you know, th there there is a problem that will depend on implementation. That low income kids often live very chaotic lives, and they're moving around a lot. Uh, they don't have bank accounts, so there's no account to put the money into. Um, kids, uh, I have one very good friend here um, uh, who is, uh, he was off drugs for two years. Now he's been back on since the pandemic. He has two small kids and they are both informally being raised by other people. Um, and so he will still be getting those child payments. Um, but, uh, you know, he is not actually looking after those kids mm -hmm. anymore. And it's, you know, it's hard to, there's just a d degree of dysfunction and chaos in some families that is going to make it very difficult to make sure that the money always goes to benefit that child. But having said that, this is just a huge advance in terms of child well-being. Got it. Let's go to our third poll question about unemployment insurance, if we could. I don't know if our, our folks can pull up that question. All right. Uh, should unemployment insurance be available to pay for job training and retraining while a person is still employed instead of only being available after someone loses a job? 
Yes or no? Can we use it? Uh, can we use it almost like a flexible savings account where you can draw upon it uh, to get job training and retraining and perhaps to avoid getting laid off as opposed to being having it available only after you get laid off or lose a job? Yes or no? Yes or no? All right. Well, I'm particip participating in the poll. <laughs> <laughs> What, they closed it before I was able to submit my answer. You guys were too quick on the draw. Oh my gosh, not fair. That's all right. <laughs> oh, wow. Yes, 86%. Actually, that's been one of my, my pet peeves about unemployment insurance. We wait until people lose their job before they can access it. And at that point, they're in a crisis mode trying to use unemployment insurance to pay for food and pay for housing and... and uh, maybe the educational expenses of their children, wouldn't it be better uh, to help people avoid being in that crisis mode, helping them avoid being laid off by using some of that money. Uh, and maybe it's one time, uh, you know, once every 10 years you can access it or whatever, but um, using it to actually get the job training and retraining so they don't get laid off, so they can advance and move up the career ladder, or like you say, uh, retrain from being a welder to uh, uh, being an ultrasound technician so you don't have to face that unemployment. Your, your thoughts about reforming our unemployment insurance system. So I agree with you, but under very strict limits. And I say that because we've seen the private education industry manipulate government education financing programs to promote and market uh, education courses that they claim are going to get people, you know, a great job in some field. And then essentially, it's just a, a, a way of, of getting federal funds. And uh, it often leaves a student with, uh, you know, with some debt uh, at the end. Job training programs have a mixed record. So those kind of programs have a terrible record. But there are other job training programs, often those that work closely with industry and involve apprenticeships that have an excellent record. And so I, I, I'd be very strongly in favor, but there should be really good vetting of the kind of courses uh, and you know, make sure that people who take them actually do end up in uh, jobs. Um, there's one way of financing this is something called a social impact bond, which essentially, or they're called career bonds. So they um, pay for a program, but then the student, uh, after they get a good job, they, they pay after they get a job. Uh, mm -hmm. And so if they get a, uh, you know, if it actually works out and they get a good job, then they begin to pay the, uh, the, in the institution uh, back. And, uh, you know, I love that system because that puts the onus on the, on the institution to, uh, to make sure it works. Right. And or it could be a, a combination of a contribution from the private sector. Maybe it's a yes. uh, employee employer uh, so that uh, the employer is really ensuring that uh, where they might help contribute to the cost. Uh, so they're ensuring that the worker is, in fact, getting the skills needed to, let's say, move up within the company or avoid the impacts of automation and, and uh, artificial intelligence, but really helping that person gain higher skills uh, to have a more secure job. So, uh, and I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that a corporation right now, that if it invests in capital equipment to uh, replace a worker, then there's preferential uh, tax advantage compared to investing in worker retraining so that workers can can develop better skills, even though one should argue socially, it should be the opposite. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's take a couple of questions from our audience and, and our students uh, before we run out of time. So Christina, uh, take it away. Sure. Thank you very much, Governor Locke and Mr. Kristoff for the great conversation that we've had so far. Here are some questions that the audience has asked. Our first question is from Dakota, a student in the School of Public Affairs. Dakota asks, a large proportion of the working class face high medical expenses. How does the prospect of government provided healthcare fit into this conversation? Um, really important question, Dakota. And um, I would emphasize the importance of, uh, of healthcare for kids. Um, 
you know, it's kind of crazy that the United States has uh, universal health care for people over age 65, and which is really expensive, and not for people under 18, which is really cheap. And of course, the reason we do that is that people over 65 vote and people under 18 don't. Um, but um, the, you know, so many people in the working class lose out because uh, they not only die substantially early, there's a 20 year gap in life expectancy between uh, the, uh, the top socioeconomically in the US and the bottom socioeconomically. It's about three times the race gap in the US, the class gap, if you will, is three times the race gap in life expectancy in the US. And a lot of that is, uh, is issues of access to healthcare. I mean, frankly, a lot of it is also behaviors. Uh, smoking is much more prevalent uh, in, uh, among uh, people lower in socioeconomic status in the US. Um, and, uh, but uh, providing universal access to healthcare, and I would argue dental care, you know, it, it strikes me as appalling that the US is the only uh, uh, advanced country that doesn't provide it. Mm -hmm. All right. Christina, next question. Our next question comes from Amy. Amy would like to know what role can or should labor unions play in making sure working families have a living wage and are not working two to three jobs to afford basic needs, housing, health, and food? So um, I've really over time changed my attitudes toward uh, labor unions over the years. Um, and I think that, you know, like a lot of um, sort of educated liberals, I was somewhat scornful of unions. And then over time, the evidence just became overwhelming that as private sector labor unions declined as a share of the labor force, um, that, <laughs> I mean, they stopped feather bedding, but corporations started feather bedding and they didn't have the kind of scrutiny and, and counterbalance. Um, and there's some estimates that about a quarter of the uh, uh, of the increase in inequality since the 1970s comes from the decline in those private sector labor unions. So, um, and, uh, and of course, private sector labor unions, they not only benefit those who are actually the people in those unions, but also those who hold other comparable jobs uh, in the labor force. So um, I would like to see measures to, um, to, to, to strengthen uh, those unions in particular, Corporations essentially have an incentive to fire labor organizers, and they end up paying minimal fines, uh, which for a corporation is, you know, if you pay $20,000 for having fired your five labor organizers, you know, that's in your financial interest. You'll do it every time. You, you know, you find them $10 million, uh, then they may think twice about it. I, I would say that I think there's a difference between private sector and public sector labor unions. Um, and the issue with public sector labor unions seems more complicated to me. We've seen that with police unions protecting problematic officers. We've seen that with teacher unions um, in resisting uh, sending kids back to school, uh, for example. I think it's, you know, it's, it's more complicated in the case of public sector. Yeah. And of course, so much of what we take for granted in our daily work lives uh, from unemployment insurance, health insurance benefits, health and safety, un you know, workers' compensation, et cetera, et cetera, is thanks to the, the huge sacrifices and, and the struggles of organized labor uh, going back almost a century. That's exactly right. But at the same time, I mean, Amazon workers just soundly rejected a proposal to unionize. And so if the workers themselves don't want uh, uh, to, to organize, then um, does that mean that labor is irrelevant or losing its relevance or its appeal? I, um, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not ready to reach that conclusion yet. I think that the context in which these decisions are made is still so heavily balanced in favor of the corporation. Um, that um, I, I think that outcomes may be different if there is a different environment in which one casts those ballots, and in particular, uh, less intimidation and less concern on the part of of uh, union activists that you know that they won't get punished and fired if they do support a union. So, 
it's an open, I mean, I will have to see. Okay. All right. Christina. Our next question is from Jake, a student in the School of Public Affairs. Jake wants to know two major increasing concerns this century, Northern climate driven migration and automation will inevitably harm our employment numbers. How do you think these factors will play into the progressive discourse on ensuring good paying union jobs for working class Americans? So there's a line of thinking um, that uh, jobs, uh, we will just have too many people and we can't, uh, you know, we can't provide jobs for everybody. Um, that automation is just going to replace, you know, too many people. And I'd say that I'm something of a skeptic about that and that labor economists generally are somewhat skeptical of that. Uh, although, I mean, there is disagreement about it, but, uh, but in general, I'd say labor economists point that people have been making that argument uh, forever. And they said that, uh, you know, when we no longer have horses and no longer need all these people to look after horses, uh, that uh, then, um, uh, you know, that then there'll be much less demand for labor. Um, uh, when machines began to spread that, oh, you know, there'll be no need for workers. And in fact, of course, we have an explosion of, uh, of, of new industries that could never have been imagined. Um, I tend to think that is what is going to happen. Um, and uh, that's one reason that I'm a skeptic of UBI, whereas people who think there are going to be no jobs tend to be more sympathetic to it. But if, if a lot of the jobs that are being created are going to be in the in the service sector, retail, uh, call center, warehousing, um, as it, provided that ro robots don't take over the function of those warehouse distribution centers, uh, but uh, or even Starbucks baristas, I mean, can, are those livable wages? Even if we were to pay twenty two dollars an hour, are those livable wages? And 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 will uh, people be able to be able to get an affordable house, certainly in the urban areas. So um, judging by the experience in Denmark, say, um, you know, $22 an hour can produce, uh, people can afford to buy homes, to live a decent life, et cetera. And I would also say that um, while we tend to, to think so much about the you know the the worker at McDonald's or the or the barista that there also are an awful lot of um, higher tech jobs in those sectors that involve trying to figure out you know how the co where the coffee comes from and uh, the machines to order your coffee or your McDonald's order or how to maintain them and so um, you know I think that there will tend to be a progression toward more value added. Um, and we've seen that in agriculture that, you know, we went from 60% of the labor force being involved in agriculture to uh, what, maybe 2% now. And um, yet, um, um, you know, and, and a significant number of those agricultural jobs are actually, you know, fairly high tech and fairly sophisticated. But what about your own town in Oregon where all those timber jobs left because of automation and, and et cetera, et cetera, and, or even some of the environmental policies? Uh, I know that there's now more jobs or, I mean, it's stabilized in timber areas, certainly in the state of Washington where, uh, you know, they're, they're trying to thin trees and they know that we need to grow trees, but also harvest trees and use wood because they capture carbon. I mean, they are a great sequester of, of carbon. So we, uh, an actually robust timber industry in which we rotate and harvest and then build homes using wood or even office buildings and apartment buildings using wood is so much better for the environment than let's say using steel or concrete and brick and mortar, et cetera, et cetera. But we're losing those jobs. We're still losing those jobs. What is the, what is the solution then for, uh, for these towns across from Oregon to Maine? So I think one of the toughest lessons has been that geographically based solutions tend not to work very well. So there are a lot of towns in Eastern Oregon, for example, uh, and I suspect in Eastern Washington that have lost traditional, often resource-based forms of employment. And I'm not sure that they have a long-term business model. Um, I think that's also a huge problem for a lot of Native American 
reservations uh, in the arid West, um, that there's always been a lot of talk about providing bandwidth and people can work from anywhere. And in fact, you know, people have been saying that for decades and it's been very hard to actually revive the economies of some of these rural areas, whether in Oregon uh, or, or anywhere else. Um, so there may, it may be that we can't build a strong business model in Burns, Oregon, or um, you know, in uh, Pine Ridge Reservation, for example, in South Dakota. I think though that we can provide meaningful jobs uh, to, to people who are, um, uh, and it's hard to envision what they will be. I mean, healthcare, for example, is providing an explosion of new jobs that, that, that we could not have imagined. My, um, uh, we have a dog. Yesterday, we took our, uh, the, the dog unfortunately has melanoma. We took our, our dog to a canine oncologist. Uh, and, you know, canine oncologists do not used to exist. Uh, the, the, the veterinary office also uh, noted that there are canine chaplains available for people who are distressed by their dog's hand. You know, canine chaplains did not exist. And it's very difficult to, to predict exactly how jobs emerge. But um, there certainly are all kinds of new ones that do arise, provided people have the education to, um, to adapt and, and compete for them. Okay. All right. Next question, Christina. Jake has another question for us. Jake would like to know, do you think universal and strong high school education truly has a distinct effect on how people work, flipping burgers, for example? Just by comparing McDonald's wages, surely the U.S. education system isn't three times worse than Denmark's. Um, I think that there really is a huge, a huge gap and and a huge uh, difference between uh, that high school degree and the lack of it. And we see that, for example, in people who get a high school degree versus a GED, that we think of them intellectually as being comparable, but they're not. Outcomes for those who have GEDs are way worse than those who simply have the high school degree. And of course, those who don't even get a GED are, are still worse. And I think that, um, you know, if you compare Denmark, for example, or, you know, Canada or much of Northern Europe to the US, then it's not just a function of the fact that we have, you know, about 15% of Americans who don't, um, uh, who don't graduate from high school, but um, the number of Americans who are functionally illiterate is much, much higher than in, in Northern Europe, for example. The share who are uh, wrestling with addiction, you know, more than 10 million Americans wrestling with substance abuse, um, that leads to chaos and dysfunction. One in seven American kids is right now living with a parent with, um, uh, with a substance abuse problem and uh, often this, you know, is associated with domestic violence, with just a degree of, of, of chaos in the household. And I think that that really is much, much more common in the U.S. than in some of our peer countries. Um, and while there are no perfect solutions, I think that a focus on children and on education uh, can make a huge difference. Mm -hmm. How many other questions do we have, uh, Christina? Any other? We have a couple more. Okay, why don't we quickly try to get to those maybe who haven't asked a question yet? Sure. Our next question is from Jenny, who studies in the School of Public Affairs. Jenny asks, do you have any thoughts on the social capital of whiteness and how that has been used historically to pit working class white people and working class black and brown people against each other to inhibit the threatening power of class solidarity to the government and state powers? It's a really interesting question. Um, and um, I, uh, you know, Bobby Kennedy, I think was, uh, did a brilliant job in trying to knit together uh, the black and white working classes and argued very much for precisely this kind of solidarity. And the white working class was very suspicious of, uh, of that kind of outreach because they, they thought that uh, if their unions, for example, admitted African-Americans, that that would uh, erode jobs for their kids, et cetera. Um, but he was making real progress. And 
Then, of course, he was assassinated in 1968. And since then, um, I, Democrats have, particularly in, in, under Reagan and since, have tended to lose some of their uh, strength in blue collar white communities. There's a perception in the US that uh, blue collar uh, white Americans are conservative. And I think, I think it's a little more complicated than that. Essentially, working class Americans, whether black or white, tend to be socially conservative and economically liberal. So if the question is something about faith, uh, if it's about abortion, uh, then they're more likely to be conservative. Um, if it's about raising the minimum wage, then they're more likely to be liberal. Now, when uh, working class African Americans go to the polls, they vote Democratic because issues of racial justice trump those issues of uh, abortion or whatever other social conservative issues uh, are on their minds. When working class whites go to the polls, they uh, have often tended to vote Republican because the issues of of uh, you know, uh, faith or guns, whatever it may be, tend to trump those issues of the minimum wage. Um, I, you know, I think the Democrats need to do a better job of um, of, of doing what Bobby Kennedy did, of try to listen to to those working class constituents, make clear that they're fighting for them, uh, and um, try to be respectful of those issues of faith, et cetera. Trying not to be condescending. Um, and, you know, one isn't going to win every one of those votes, but one, uh, one can do uh, a better job in, in winning them. Um, and, um, you know, and I just, you mentioned social capital, uh, I think it was Jenny who asked the question. You know, I, I think that that's a really good lens through which to see some of the problems in towns like mine, um, given the extent to which I think lost jobs was the car was the cause of so much of the unraveling of the social fabric here. I've often wondered why it was that in the Great Depression this town was not more damaged, uh, and there you know there wasn't an increase in suicide and, and uh, addiction and alcoholism as far as I can tell in that period, and and uh, the social fabric stood strong. And I think it's because in the Great Depression, in towns like this, there were a lot of uh, community institutions that provided a buffer from outside economic hardship and people, there was a strong, uh, uh, truly a strong degree of social capital that had withered over the decades. And organizations like the Grange uh, collapsed, the PTA, uh, churches became much less strong. There was a loneliness, a social isolation uh, that made it more likely that people would then um, self-medicate with meth rather than collectively medicate uh, you know, at, the, at the church or the Grange or whatever it might be. And this is a problem all around the Western world. There is a degree of loneliness that I think is a, is a large problem. Britain has appointed a minister for loneliness. Um, I think other countries should, uh, should you know, think about that too. There are no magic solutions. Are there things that can be done at the margin that may mitigate that loneliness and help? Uh, yeah, I think there are. Our time is coming to a close, and and you know we we started this by saying you know our, our Democrats have Democrats and Republicans failed the working class. So um, in in your article, whether it's about your pal Mike, um, if you were to advise the, the the people in D.C., including the administration, President Biden, and the members of Congress, Democrats or Republicans, what should they be focusing on? Given given the mood, the anxiety, the worries, the the, and even the dreams and aspirations of people in, in towns like, uh, like Yamhill, Oregon, or, or places in, in Ohio and Maine, what would you be saying are, are the things that they really need to focus on? So I would say, you know, get stuff done. Uh, and I think that there are two kind of visions of, for the Democratic Party. And one, I think, is, you know, Biden's emphasis on actually getting money out there, increasing well-being. I, I'm all in favor of that. And another has been a liberal impulse that, frankly, we've seen to some degree in Seattle and in Portland um, that has been about uh, often gestures of inclusion, uh, uh, 
about uh, symbolism. Um, California has been somewhat prone to this, you know, renaming schools uh, in San Francisco rather than actually focusing on getting kids back in school. Um, and, uh, you know, the Seattle, are, you're, you're in Seattle, I think, Gary. Right. Right? I mean, yep. you know, Seattle famously last summer had the, this downtown district to the police were kept out of a six block area. Uh, and um, it was supposed to protect this area from police violence. And there were six shootings in that area. It was it left, I think, a lot of Washingtonians sort of reminded of the value of police rather than proving the initial point. And so I think that the, the Biden effort to uh, address child poverty, to focus on worker retraining, provide universal uh, child care. Uh, I think that you know that is an approach that will resonate with working class Americans and will be vindicated uh, by history. Um, so um, I, I'm all in favor. What do you think? You you've been around uh, in at the in the governor's mansion. You've been in in the cabinet. What uh, what do you think? Well, I went back to the state legislature a few years ago, and I, I went into the House Democrats and I said, you know, uh, you all are in for a rude awakening. That so much of what you pass are so-called liberal progressive issues. And I said, hey, don't get me wrong. I support them 100%. And I would be voting yes on all of those things. But for the people in rural Washington, while they, you know, while obviously climate change affects them and while mental illness affects almost every family, they don't see it as being really top of mind uh, and um, or even homeless programs. I mean, you know, people are just a paycheck away from being losing their homes or their apartments and being out on the street. But those aren't the issues that seem to resonate and are on the top of minds of everyday Americans. And that unless Democrats really touch the issues that affect people on a daily basis, whether it's childcare, whether it's job training and retraining, um, they're gonna, I said, you guys are gonna be in for rude awakening and you're gonna lose some elections. And sure enough, the next election cycle, parts of Washington that have never voted for a Republican in, the, uh, in, in presidential elections flipped Republican. I mean, they had not voted for a Republican since Franklin Roosevelt more than 50 years before, 60 years before. Actually, 1930, so 70 years before, right? right? They voted Republican. And, and, and even Orrin Cass, uh, no, excuse me, even um, uh, J.D. Vance says that the Democrats and Republicans have been failing these communities. They're, they're ignoring their policies. They focus on the, the Republicans focusing on trade and, and wealth. Uh, tax breaks for corporations and Democrats um, in some ways almost condescending with their policies toward, toward the working class. And people, like you say, have pride. They want to work. They have a sense of, of responsibility. Uh, and yes, there are some people that maybe game the system, but down deep, they want help. They want real everyday help on policies that affect them immediately. And Democrats and Republicans have been focused on so many other issues and almost forgetting them, which is why uh, even some Republican commentators have said that that's why Trump had an appeal, because at least he was talking about the issues that, that resonated with them, despair, job loss, um, th that sense of community. And while the prescriptions may have been unrealistic, and 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 many of these commentators said, people in in Yamath and and Appalachia are going to be in for a rude awakening when he cannot deliver. He will not bring back all those coal jobs. He will not bring back all the manufacturing. He will not be able to stop, uh, you know, uh, bring back all the jobs from China, et cetera, et cetera. And so there will be a disconnect. But I think that, like you said. Um, uh, Democrats and Republicans, while they supported globalization at first, never talked about the impact on communities, what it would do to those small town manufacturing facilities or the Detroit uh, right. and, and just basically give unemployment insurance instead of whether it's free co community college education or job training and retraining. So um, 
I, I really appreciate all your articles trying to uh, bring home uh, the impact of these policies on people and, and instead of focusing on, on the, the theoretical and the abstract, how do these policies affect everyday people from your pal Mike uh, to the Knapp family in Yamath, Oregon? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So our time is up and we promised people we'd get them out. And, and uh, let me just say, uh, Nicholas, it's really been a pleasure having you on. And, and as, as we started all these different seminars, we were always talking about eventually, how does this come back, whether it's trade, globalization, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, relations with China, how does that impact everyday people in America, and especially the working class? Uh, so it's been a great having you kind of pull this all together and uh, being our concluding speaker and, and uh, uh, bringing all of this full circle. Uh, thank you very much, Nicholas. And, great. Uh, Thanks a lot. Thanks. Christina, all thank things. you very much, Christina. Thank you very much. And, and don't forget, folks, uh, a great, great book, Tightrope, uh, by Nicholas Kristoff and his wife, Cheryl Wudun. Uh, and they've written several, several um, uh, Pulitzer or award-winning books. So with that, thank you all very much.